Hello, my name is Van Weigel, and welcome to this presentation explaining the relationship between worldviews and moral values. We begin with two definitions. First, worldviews. I define worldviews as beliefs or ideologies or stocks of knowledge that are held by social actors in particular cultures. And then I define moral values as self-chosen or socialized standards that guide actions in morally relevant context. Now, let me say a, a few words about each of these. For all intents and purposes, a worldview is the way that an individual sees the world. Now, since all of us are shaped by our individual experiences and our beliefs, one could argue that uh, in a class of, say, 25 individuals, there could be 25 different worldviews. That really becomes impractical, though, to use that term worldview in that context. Instead, we want to make generalizations about the nature of differences that could occur as a result of culture, ethnicity, um, and other factors such as religious belief, for example, that would uh, shape an individual's worldviews. And it is in that more general concept that I'd like to use the term worldviews. So instead of having 25 worldviews, we might be looking at something like more like four or five uh, different worldviews in order to make some kind of generalization uh, of, of this concept. Now, another um, aspect of this is that all of us, to some extent, share a scientific worldview. When we see lightning and hear thunder, we don't think as the ancients that something's happening in the heavens uh, and this is uh, affecting uh, the atmosphere, the sky around us. No, we think more about this from a scientific standpoint that, uh, that it's about to rain. Uh, so, uh, in that sense, all of us do share a scientific worldview. Now, moral values can either be self-chosen or socialized. Much of our moral ways of looking at things are socialized by significant others, family, uh, parents, uh, teachers, religious educators, etc., cetera, etc., cetera are very influential in shaping uh, understandings of morality. And you could think of this as a natural process of socialization that people go through as they move through childhood into adulthood. But the bottom line is no one completely accepts what other people tell them about the nature of right or wrong. There is always some degree of redefinition, experimentation, um, whatever that takes place in the normal course of human development. And so moral values always have an element of being self-chosen because people arrive at their own conclusions about the values that they uh, want to um, hold for their, for their lives. You will note that in one of the textbooks that you will be reading, Ethics for the Real World, the authors make quite a distinction between ethics and morality and the way that they define those two terms. And I simply want to alert you to the fact that truthfully, the term ethics and morality or morals are intended to be synonymous. They are not uh, different uh, terms at all. Now, in this diagram, I am suggesting that there is a directional uh, linear uh, relationship between worldviews, moral values, and behavior. And key to this linear relationship is that worldviews have the effect of giving plausibility to moral values. Moral values, in many respects, only become sensible as they relate to a larger worldview. And of course, if there are changes in one's worldview, those would often precipitate changes in moral values. But I think this diagram is too simple, and so I would like to complicate it somewhat. Instead, I believe that this diagram more accurately represents 
the relationship between worldviews, moral values, and behavior because it identifies four sources of distortion in moving from worldviews to moral values to behavior that are critical in terms of understanding why there isn't often a direct connection between these uh, three elements. Two of those sources of distortion relate to the movement from worldviews to moral values, and that would be the distinction between an official versus directing ideology, and then cognitive moral development, and then moving from moral values to behavior, the concept of moral weakness, and then the concept of personal distance. And what I'd like to do now is to talk more specifically about each of these four sources of distortion. We begin with the distinction between an official versus directing ideology. This distinction came to us via a anthropologist named David Aberley, who made in a very extensive study of the Navajo uh, Indians in the southwestern United States. And what Aberley found out was that in Navajo belief, there were certain elements of the Navajo belief systems that were very integral to the identity of being a Navajo Indian that did not necessarily impact day-to-day -day actual behavior. And so he drew the distinction between an official ideology that's critical for one's own self-identity, group identity, and a directing ideology that concerns the kinds of rules of the road, if you will, the sorts of activities that uh, a, uh, a Navajo uh, Indian man or woman would, uh, would be involved in uh, to remain true to their um, cultural tradition. Now, one of the very interesting questions we could ask of ourselves is what would be an example of an official versus directing ideology in the United States? Now, for me, the prime candidate would be none other than the Statue of Liberty. This symbol has such meaning to people around the world. In fact, it's so meaningful that in 1989, during the student uh, protest in Tiananmen Square, where students risked their lives to, to stand down tanks, they had a facsimile of the Statue of Liberty with them. Uh, similarly, the recent protest in Hong Kong, uh, uh, there was one instance where one of the protest groups used a facsimile of the Statue of Liberty. This is a symbol that everyone understands and admires. And in fact, we have the famous poem that is inscribed on the Statue of Liberty, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. This means something. This is critical to the American ideal that we are a country of immigrants, that we are welcoming people who have been driven from their homes so that they can start a new life in the United States of America. But is this a directing ideology for us today, uh, sad to say, probably not. We would not, I think, cannot honestly characterize ourselves as being friendly and open with arms outstretched to immigrants. And that's a pretty sad commentary on our country. And it makes absolutely, by the way, no ac uh, economic sense because there's countless studies that indicate that the presence of immigrants actually helps everyone, including non-skilled workers, as well as, of course, skilled workers, to be more productive, to have a greater opportunities for employment. But we would not, I think, characterize this official ideology as being a directing ideology, at least at this stage in our, um, our development as a nation. So that would be one of the sources of distortion in moving from worldviews to moral values. Now, the second form of distortion is cognitive moral development. 
And for this, we turn to the thought of none other than Lawrence Kohlberg, uh, initially of the um, University of Chicago, uh, who then went to Harvard University. Kohlberg was fascinated by the concept that as we move from childhood through adolescence into adulthood, that with the cognitive changes that take place during that development, there are changes in also our moral orientation. He was struck, for example, um, and began thinking about this when his um, third grade son came back uh, uh, during lunch, during the lunch break, and they were just talking about how school went that morning. And um, his son uh, offered that uh, what he learned that day was the difference between good boys and bad boys. And Kohlberg said, oh, that sounds like a really interesting topic. What, uh, what did you learn from that? And so his son continued to elaborate that basically a good boy kept his desk neat, uh, made sure not to talk when the teacher uh, was speaking, uh, did not uh, harass the little girl, you know, in front of him with a pigtail, et cetera, et cetera, basically keeping his hands to himself. And those kinds of um, sort of classroom etiquette issues he had interpreted as a third grade um, child that uh, these were moral categories that would define the difference between a good boy and a bad boy. So that got Kohlberg thinking, I bet that his teacher was totally unaware that she was being a moral educator in this context. And there is a need then in terms, in terms of thinking about morality and development to understand how people at different stages of their life understand morality in different respects. So he had this idea and that was to study uh, 60 boys. And uh, one of the quirky parts of the study is it wasn't boys and girls, just 60 boys that he would study over a 20 year period and uh, find out in the course of their personal development of these young, of these boys into young men and then young adults, um, how their uh, moral orientation would change uh, over time. And he used case studies. Uh, one was called the Heinz Dilemma to try to understand how these boys understood different kinds of moral issues as they move through life. Uh, the Heinz Dilemma was um, something along this line. Um, your wife has an incurable disease. There is a cure, but it's very costly. You can't afford it. The only way that you can save her life is basically to break into a drugstore and steal the drug so that she can live. And the question is, would you decide to steal the drug? Now, Kohlberg and his associates were not concerned whether the decision was to steal the drug or not steal the drug. Instead, their focus was what sorts of reasons did people give to either steal the drug or to not steal the drug? And what they found out is that people routinely moved through four conventional stages. Um, technically, the first two are pre-conventional and stage three and four are conventional. But the idea would be is that people normally move through these four stages, moving from stage one, a punishment orientation, which is the concept of basically might makes right. Um, I will not do something because I might get punished for it. And so out of fear of being punished, I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to do what I want to do. Stage two would be identified as the narcissistic orientation, kind of similar to the terrible twos and threes, but the idea that, um, uh, everything revolves around me, I'm going to do something because it benefits me. So it's a very self-interested stage that could evolve into a kind of reciprocal scratch my back, I'll scratch yours, but is generally thought in terms of a deeply self-preoccupied, self-concerned um, moral orientation. Now, stage 
three is a really important stage for moral development because a lot of our moral ideas come from a stage three orientation. And indeed, quite interestingly, every contemporary notion of professional, if somebody says act professional, you're re referencing a stage three orientation in, in moral development. Kohlberg called it the good boy, nice girl orientation. And here the idea would be to say, okay, you want to know what's, how, what's the right way to act, to act like a good boy or a nice girl? Well, act like Joseph or act like Jenny or some other individual whom you admire and treat as a role model. And that becomes then your basis for understanding um, what would be appropriate, good or bad uh, moral conduct. So um, that is extremely influential as a uh, stage in moral development because most people learn about the nature of morality by observing others and admiring others and wanting to emulate them in some respect. And then we have stage four. And stage four would be the highest conventional stage um, that uh, most people attain to. And in fact, Kohlberg and his associates believe that roughly 70% of, of the American public are pretty much at stage four, which he identifies as the law and order orientation. And basically the stage four approach goes like this. That which is right or wrong is determined by some external authority, the law typically, that will say to me what is right or wrong. Uh, the problem, of course, with stage four thinking is the classic example of unjust laws, that uh, laws are not perfect, um, that um, you, eh, you will uh, eventually come up to a certain circumstance where your ability to trust in an external authority is going to let you down because life is a complex operation. But it is striking that if you were to ask a typical CEO, you know, what is business ethics? The uh, common response will be something to the effect of make a profit within the constraints of the law. So that would be a, an example of a law and order orientation. Instead of asking an ethical question, what do I believe? What's important for my values? Uh, the reference is to this external authority. And then what Kohlberg found is that uh, in many, in certain instances, not many, uh, in certain instances, people will graduate to either stage five or stage six. Stage five is the social contract orientation where morality is understood as something that we agree upon consensually with one another. And uh, stage six would be what he called the universal ethical principle orientation, where people rely on a universal ethical principle to um, guide them in terms of their moral behavior. Now, what's fascinating is, is that when studies were done on a more even-handed basis that included girls and young women, they found that the priority between stage five and six did not hold. They actually flipped so that stage six was the stage right after stage four and stage five, the social contract orientation was the highest stage. So that uh, reflects uh, the uh, likelihood that men and women understand um, morality in somewhat different ways when it comes to the, um, the post-conventional stages five and six. So I think that's quite, uh, quite interesting. In fact, there's a very interesting set of writings on what is termed maternal thinking that suggests that um, one of the um, critical contributions of women to ethics and to leadership has to do with understanding the web, the network of obligations in society in more um, uh, closer ways than their male counterparts and, um, and being able to 
navigate um, those uh, social obligations that sometimes are conflicting in a more effective way. Um, and so, hence, um, stage five could well be stage six. Now, in moving from moral values to behavior, we have the important source of distortion known as moral weakness. Now, moral weakness is a concept that comes to us from both Aristotle and uh, St. Paul. Um, let's begin with Aristotle. Aristotle had a debate with his teacher, Plato, about the nature of good. Um, when people do the wrong thing, is it because they did not really know the good, know the right thing to do? Uh, or did they know the right thing to do, but did had the weakness of character or moral weakness that they weren't able to do the right thing. Plato believed that if you did not do um, the right thing, you simply did not really know the right thing. But Aristotle uh, roundly disagreed with him, uh, believing that people often knew what was the right thing to do and yet did not do it. Now, this is expressed in eloquently by St. Paul in Romans chapter 7, verses 14 through 15. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But for what I hate, I do. So this, I think, describes the dilemma that all of us honestly face. There is a disjunction between our ideals uh, the values that we would like to live by and our actual behavior. And um, this is also an area of great mystery because it deals with the issue of character. What gives a person a strong character? The experience of struggle is really integral to this, but there is a tremendous mystery to this issue of character as uh, is well brought out in David Brooks' book, uh, The Road to Character. So this is something that all of us have to deal with as a source of distortion in moving from moral values that we hold dear to actual behavior. Now, returning to our diagram, our final source of distortion from moral values to behavior is the concept of personal distance. The concept of personal distance comes to us by a philosopher named Lawrence Becker, who in 1975 wrote that the greater the geographic or emotional distance from one person to the next, the greater one's potential to do harm or not to come to the assistance of another uh, exists. So in other words, high levels of personal distance that is either geographic or emotional distance will lead to the greater potential for harm or the greater potential not to come to the assistance of others who are in need. Now, I'd like to illustrate this in the following way. Let us say that this morning when you left your house or apartment, you had to physically step over an abandoned baby that had been left on your doorstep. And the question would be, would your day this morning be any different as a result of seeing an abandoned child on your doorstep? And the answer, of course, would be absolutely yes. You would not go on with whatever you were planning to do that day. Uh, seeing this child in obvious need for for care and attention, your day would be different. And anyone, any one of us would consider somebody a monster for just ignoring a child on their doorstep. But what do we do with the problem that um, because of malnutrition and malnutrition related diseases, a roughly 22,000 children die each day from malnutrition or from preventable diseases like uh, diarrhea. Uh, you'd be amazed at the number of children who die because of rapid dehydration associated with infant diarrhea as they make the transition 
from um, breast milk to um, to adult foods, um, often dealing with polluted water sources that that make that transition very uh, very tenuous. So how how can we sort of say that we care about children if they're on our doorstep, but we don't care about them as much as uh, a statistical death that um, is very distant from us. Now, one way to rethink this issue of the 22,000 children who die of malnutrition and malnutrition-related diseases is to do an analogy between um, these children and passengers on a 747-400 series. 747-400 with the standard three-class seating arrangement can hold 416 people, a maximum of 416 people. So what this would mean is the equivalent of what is taking place today that isn't grabbing people's attention would be like having a 747-400 series go down, that is crash, every 25 minutes. And the question would be, how many of those planes would actually have to go down before the world would stop and say, hold it, we've got to do something about this. This is like really serious. Every 747 needs to be grounded until we figure out why so many people are losing their lives on these planes. We couldn't, we would not go two hours before every, every the entire world's attention was riveted on this problem of 747s falling out of the sky. So why is it that we have such a great difficulty comprehending the immense need for, um, for children to be economically supported so that they don't die uh, in the way that they do currently because of malnutrition and malnutrition-related diseases? This is a big example of this problem of personal distance. Another example of personal distance comes to us from the Vietnam War involving a young Christian scientist, Air Force pilot named Donald Dawson, who was trained uh, uh, in the U.S. Air Force Ca Academy in 1969 and flew missions um, from Guam to Cambodia to try to uh, destroy arms caches that had been preset on the Cambodian-Vietnam border to, with the intention of resupplying the Viet Cong in their war effort during the Vietnam War. Now, they used a bombing technique known as arc light bombing, or sometimes this is referred to as carpet bombing, that is, for all intents and purposes, the closest way to simulate a nuclear bomb using conventional means. A large B-52 is fitted out with a full complement of 500 and 750 pound bombs, uh, typically numbering 100 in bombs in total, and then flying at 35,000 feet, drops them simultaneously on a box that's roughly one half mile wide and two and a half miles long. And the effect of this arc light bombing is nothing above ground survives. So one day after Dawson had returned from uh, their bombing run in on the Cambodian border, he heard a very disturbing story. And basically the story was this. A navigator had made a mistake. He forgot to flip a switch that would correct for the navigations using ground beacons that had been preset to identify their target. And instead of boxing this arms cache in the middle of the jungle, because of this error navigationally, they bombed a village. And I know it seems odd to say this, but in the middle of the day, if you destroyed a village, the loss of life would not be as great as one might think because of the fact that people would be out in the fields cultivating rice and doing the sorts of things that would be done outside of the village. But sadly, in this moment, 
there was a wedding that was taking place in the village, and 125 people were gathered there. Uh, one moment, they experienced the joy of this wedding, and the next moment, life ended. Of course, no sound takes place when you are dropping this much ordnance at 35,000 feet. Nobody is aware that there's a, a B-52 uh, overhead at all. Well, as Dawson thought about this, he had great difficulty processing what had happened in this story in light of the fact that he held his own marriage in such high esteem. It was such a sacred moment for his life that it was beyond comprehension that this Cambodian wedding party had been destroyed in this fashion. And so the connection, the personal connection that he had between the reverence and regard for his own wedding uh, ceremony and what had taken place there had the effect of collapsing the personal distance that 35,000 feet had, had afforded him. And so he decided to refuse to fly and was summarily court-martialed. Now, there's probably no example of personal distance as great as that of this personage, Otto Adolf Eichmann. Who is Eichmann? He was the low-level German bureaucrat charged with organizing Hitler's final solution, rounding up Jews, Catholics, homosexuals, uh, the mentally ill, putting them into concentration camps and killing them. And amidst his visits to Auschwitz and Dachau and the other death camps, one of the interesting facts on the ground is that no one ever saw Eichmann kill somebody. And yet he himself was responsible for the deaths of 6 million people. Well, what was fascinating is that during the trial that took place in Jerusalem, pictured here, Eichmann reflected on an experience that he had in Poland after he came upon a mobile gassing van, which was a new technology used during the Nazi Third Reich to avoid bringing people to the camp to kill them why not just collect them in this van and then dispose of their bodies uh, by, beside the road? And so this was their new technology that they were dealing with. And Eichmann during his trial states as follows, as he, as he came upon this mobile gassing van, I cannot tell how many Jews entered. I hardly looked. I could not. I could not. I had had enough. Then I drove along after the van, and then I saw the most horrible sight that I had seen thus far in my life. The truck was making for an open ditch. The doors were open. The corpses were thrown out. There I got enough. I was finished. I only remember that a physician in white overalls told me to look through a hole in the truck while they were still in it. I refused to do that. I could not. I had to disappear. Okay, the words of someone responsible for organizing the deaths of six million people by personal distance, who himself never killed anyone. This is a very cautionary tale about this problem of personal distance that we face in our society. And it is something that um, I think we all should really reflect upon in our own lives. On that somber note, we conclude the presentation.